So good afternoon and welcome to CAPA's COVID-19 Health Wrong. Today, we are going to discuss the basics of vaccine safety evaluation. Thank you all in advance for joining us today. So I am Kareen Utley. I am the technical officer of CAPA's Caribbean Regulatory System, CRS. Joining me today on the panel is Dr. Joyce and John, who is the executive director of CAPA, Dr. Rianne Extovo, who is the technical coordinator of the Caribbean Regulatory System, CRS, and Ms. Begonia, who is PAHO advisor for the sub-region of the Caribbean office. So just a few things before we get started. Please note that your audio and video settings for this webinar have been disabled. So if you have any questions during the lecture, kindly post them in the question and answer box. Before you leave us, there'll be a short survey that we would like you to complete. And it's just to give us some feedback about the webinar and how we can improve. Also, kindly indicate if you would like to receive a certificate of participation. So I'll now invite Dr. Joyce and John, Executive Director of CAFA, to bring us some greetings all the way from Barbados. Over to you, Dr. St. John. Thank you so much, Karine. And I am very pleased that we are able to host this COVID-19 health rounds on the basics of vaccine safety evaluation. But I'm even more pleased that so many people have joined to hear this. This is a very important webinar. And I think that it's very good that so many of you want to hear the latest information to get a true understanding of not only the issues of vaccine safety, but the evaluation of vaccine safety. Now we are in a very critical phase of the pandemic. And we are also in an early phase of the pandemic. Never mind, we've been struggling with this for over a year. It is still rather early in the game for a couple of reasons. One, this scientific knowledge is still being developed about the virus and the vaccine. Second, we have had recently quite a bit of mutation and the staying of these mutants in the global setting. And we're also getting a lot of spreading of the mutants, the, the, sorry, the, the, the variants not mutants, the variants. And so the issues of vaccine safety are critical. As more persons are taking the vaccine, and I'm talking about hundreds of thousands and millions, some unexpected things are happening which will give people concerns about vaccine safety. And this webinar is going to give you all the tools you need for your own decision-making. It's important also because the recent reports of issues with vaccine safety in other locations outside of CARICOM have given people concerns about taking the vaccine, just at the point where we need to be getting our vaccine coverage against SARS-CoV-2 virus at a very high level in order to protect persons from getting ill, getting severely ill, being hospitalized, and also dying. So without any further ado, I want to welcome your intense concentration on what will be delivered. It's a lot of information, but if you listen carefully, it's very easy to understand. So thanks very much, Karine, and all the best, Rianne. Over. Thank you, Dr. St. John, for those warm greetings. So now we'll go over the aim and objectives for today's webinar. 
So the aim of today's webinar is to provide you, the healthcare professionals, regulatory authorities, and health administrators with an overview of the system involved in vaccine safety monitoring. So at the end of this webinar, you should be able to describe a few things, which include the sources of information used to evaluate the safety of COVID-19 vaccines, the various stakeholders involved in vaccine safety evaluation, describe the goals and activities of post-marketing vaccine safety surveillance, identify the classifications of adverse events following immunization or AEFIs, outline the processes involved in the management of an AEFI case report, describe the healthcare workers' role in vaccine safety monitoring, and lastly, identify both regional and global vaccine surveillance systems. So without further ado, I will now introduce today's speaker, Dr. Rianne Marie Extovor. She is the technical coordinator of the Caribbean Regulatory System of CARFA. Dr. Extovor is a registered pharmacist with a BSc in pharmacy, MSc in clinical pharmacy, pharmacovigilance, and pharmacoepidemiology. She has a doctor of philosophy degree in clinical and administrative pharmacy, certification in pharmaceutical regulatory affairs. She has worked in various hospital and community settings and as a lecturer at the School of Pharmacy, St. Augustine Campus, UWI. She has experience with research in the pharmaceutical systems, medicines information, medicines utilization, Perception towards adverse event reporting and vaccine confidence, CAFA. Her responsibilities as the technical coordinator of the CRS include the oversight of technical work of the CRS, which includes product dossiers, management of the regional network for pharmacovigilance and post market surveillance, which is VGCARIB, strategic planning, policy development, and implementation development of training tools and resources, support of pharmaceutical regulatory strengthening in the CAFA member states, and CAFA's COVID-19 response, which includes technical work, newsletters, social media, and executive briefings. So I'll now hand you over or invite Dr. Rianne Extovor to take over. Over to you, Dr. Extovor. Thank you, Karine. And as soon as you can pause sharing, I'll share my screen. Yes. And I know we started getting questions about the, um, the upcoming about certificates. And just to let you all know that it will be built into the survey, which we will display at the end of the webinar. So just to start off and give you a little background as to why this was important, a lot of information has been circulating and it was not, we noted that health professionals and those who would be posed questions by patients about vaccine safety may not have an, a full grasp as to how vaccine safety evaluation is done, not just before marketing, but um, while its vaccines are in use. So to achieve the objectives that Karine have, has outlined, I've mapped it out. First of all, talking about the vaccines in general, the ones that we are aware of and that are in use and approved, and give you an overview as to how they are evaluated before those approvals and what the regulators continue to do with the manufacturers uh, providing information to determine the safety of the vaccines. The stakeholders that are involved, and this would point to the roles of different players how vaccine safety surveillance is uh, framed in terms of systems, the goals and the approaches used because it's not just one approach. What are we talking about when we speak about different types of adverse events and how the reporting systems nationally, regionally and globally, how they work together to give us a full picture as the, the vaccine safety profiles. So in the Caribbean and um, on, on the CAFA, there are 26 member states, and we continue to track the vaccines deployed um, throughout the region. And we've noted based on PAHO's dashboard 
almost 1.5 million doses being distributed um, or administered to populations in our region. The common ones are AstraZeneca by SK Biosciences, as well as the EU loans, and most of them are through COVAX. There is Covishield, which is made by the Serum Institute of India. And this was through technology transfer with, uh, between AstraZeneca and Serum Institute. So they have partnered and Serum Institute developed using the same formulation, developed a vaccine and branded it. And that was, that's a normal arrangement between manufacturers. Pfizer BioNTech's vaccine, Comunati, Sinopharm, Moderna's vaccine, Janssen, which we commonly call Johnson & Johnson, Gamaleya's Research Institute of Russia. They produce Sputnik V and their small amounts that have been deployed um, in the region as well. So all of these will need to be monitored in terms of their use and safety in among our member states. We are familiar with four major types, but these, this isn't um, there's a simple way of grouping them, grouping the vaccines. So the messenger RNA vaccines utilize a synthetic message or protein that teaches the cell how to make antibodies and generate immunity. And we see that with Pfizer and Moderna. Then the inactivated or weakened virus vaccine approach, that's what Sinopharm and Sinovac use to make their vaccines. There's a protein-based approach that would be, could be used, and the Cuban vaccines are utilizing this approach, and viral vector vaccines like AstraZeneca's vaccines, Janssen and Sputnik V, which use adenovirus as the vectors. And I mentioned this because the way in which a vaccine is made, the platform used may also have some safety implications that um, regulators pay attention to and monitor going forward. And that's how we know um, some of the common reactions we can expect. It's sometimes it's based on vector or the type of platform that's used to design it. This is a spreadsheet or a simple way of mapping the different platforms uh, of vaccines that are in development and those are in, that are in use. There are over 300 candidate vaccines being developed throughout the world, 223 are in preclinical studies. And what we know of in terms of clinical trials in humans, about 102 based on WHO's information. So clinical trials are the studies that are done in humans. So as you can see, although we have 18 in use, there are more that are continuing to be developed and they would have the benefit of learning from the precursors per se, or the, the vaccines that are currently in use, particularly as we learn about variants there are vaccines that are constant that will continue to develop because um, it's predicted that SARS-CoV-2 is not going to just simply you know, go away. We will be with it. It will be with us for a while. So before a vaccine is approved for marketing, the vaccine trial process is the main part of which we start to get information on its safety. The preclinical studies are done in animals and the simple questions that are posed relate to, does it produce an immune response in the animal model? What types of cells are generated when we expose the animal to this? And does it protect, does it provide antibodies or the immune response we want after the virus is reintroduced? Once the candidate meets the required safety parameters there, then it moves to phase one and again to phase two and three. But it must, if it's if there's any marker of uh, toxicity at that point, that candidate does not proceed further. At phase one, you will find it's done with small numbers of healthy persons, less usually less than 100 or less than 200 persons, to determine yes again is it safe. But what is the immune response in humans in a small number of healthy humans? Then at phase two. We are scaling it up now to more people to determine what's the best dose to use in humans. Is this dose safe or not? Is the lower dose safe and still does it still produce the immune response we need to protect the person? So they would use a range of doses because you want to utilize the smallest amount you need to to produce the immune response to provide protection. And at phase three, this is where it's rolled out in thousands of persons. Some trials go up to 40,000 persons, another trial may have been 23,000. 
between 20 to 40,000. And the main idea is in a randomized setting, does it continue to work at the dose we identified it as? And does it produce, what are the common side effects we can anticipate? And we will see some uncommon side effects that we can check in, let's say, in 10, one in 10,000 persons. You can determine that, that determined at phase three. So taking a look at how phase trials are done, there are limitations to it. And I want to remind persons that all medicines and vaccines have benefits as well as risks. It, is, it would not be wise of us to assume that vaccines are completely free of any kind of risk. That would not be true. So the safety implications that come inherent with vaccine platforms have to be taken into consideration. But we also have to know at the time of which the phase three trials produce enough information to, for us to say, yes, we can rule it out, we could use it. That evidence needs to be robust, but we need to continue to look at the vaccines in real world conditions, because when we roll it out to millions of persons, that's when we start to see very rare side effects or adverse events. In addition, when we roll it out to populations, we're starting to see it being used in persons with comorbidities, persons taking multiple medicines, persons of a wider range, perhaps of age groups as we go continue and the data comes to, um, comes to light. So post-market safety monitoring continues to be important so that we can identify any new or changing risks as quickly as possible and to respond to it and um, protect the populations. This is one um, useful graphic I found by the European Medicines Agency and I just did a little modification um, so pharmaceutical quality, we have the manufacturing spectrum that starts in the lab and it continues to animal studies and then clinical trials in persons. So at the top, you will see in pink that from the lab level, the quality is also important because that gives us information on safety. Toxicity is extracted from animal studies. But once we start clinical trials, any safety information that emerges from clinical trials Part of the clinical trial approval in a country includes reporting of safety events that occur during the trials. And that begins to populate national databases of suspected adverse reactions. At the point of the regulator, the regulator evaluates and makes a decision. They look at both the benefits and the evidence of the risk and determine is that is the balance acceptable for use in larger populations. The ones that approval um, is passed, the manufacturer can then scale up production. But the evaluation of safety does not stop at the point of marketing and administration. Phase four clinical trials are, are designed where manufacturers continue to study the effects. In addition, phase three trials that I mentioned earlier do not simply end as approval. Phase three trials for these vaccines will continue for at least two years. So those patients will continue to be followed. And that's why you will see um, additional updates, additional publications, and additional recommendations coming forward based on additional emerging data for phase three and phase four trials. Medical literature of um, those who publish, researchers who publish, maybe they, they're teams that will be doing additional research, continuing research in laboratory animals, continuing research in small numbers of persons, and we're seeing that literature coming out. That also informs the safety profile. Post-marketing monitoring, um, safety monitoring in terms of what the kind of events that are being reported at the national level, that feeds into it, safety studies. So all of these forms of information continue to be used by regulators to re-evaluate the benefit risk balance. Because if that changes, then they have to take action to um, minimize risk. So some characteristics to keep in mind for COVID-19 vaccine candidates. These are new vaccines. They've never been used in persons on a large scale until well now. All the information we're getting that we had before they were approved is based on trials but the dossiers were evaluated before licensure. The rare events that we want to monitor for 
will start to be seen when we use it in the real world. So that's why monitoring by health professionals, reporting by patients would be important to feed back into that evaluation system. The number of persons being exposed continues to grow and the different types of profiles of patients will also continue to shift and change depending on how the country ruled out that those vaccine, that vaccine deployment. So key things to keep in mind um, when we think about priority populations, because the order of priority may vary slightly from country to country. Some countries may choose to vaccinate the very elderly. Some may choose to vaccinate persons with comorbidities first and then move to older adults. But this is another situation in where that we traditionally vaccinate children and pregnant women. So the populations themselves are, this is new to the populations in terms of reporting of adverse effects, just the whole process of it. For health professionals, this is also new because now they're seeing more and more patients who would may have come after vaccination to report something. And if they don't have the tools or the know-how, we can find ourselves missing out on information. We are giving vaccines to adults, particularly older adults who have comorbid conditions. So there's an additional, there are additional factors that we have to keep in mind versus for children who have not developed comorbid conditions. And we hope that they remain healthy enough to prevent this. Information on interactions with medications, again, that's also that those would not be fully known. And vaccinees, we have vaccinees who are in the reproductive age group that may not be aware of pregnancy status when they receive the vaccine. So that sort of monitoring is another special group that um, governments need to keep track of. In terms of the pharmacovigilance systems, the governments or the national authorities that license the, the vaccines need to have a system in place to track those vaccines and to ensure that the ones that are in use, that if they see a strange lot number, they can identify if it's authorized or not, and then do further investigations. Risk management plans are documents that the manufacturers provide to the authorizing agency or to WHO. And that's the way in which the manufacturer says, this is what I'm going to continue doing. This is how I'm going to track patients or users this is how I'm going to track the vaccines. This is how I will work with national authorities. These additional studies we'll be doing because they have a responsibility to continue to share this information and to update the information. For instance, the product label or the product information we find that they have a commitment to work with national authorities to make those updates as well. At the regulatory level in the country, in our case, ministries of health, national adverse events committees that track, review, and assess these vaccine events will need to have special training. And PAHO has started training um, some of personnel involved in these programs. And training and surveillance systems now need to be prepared for larger volumes of reporting of these events so that they can then process it and share it to global database, hopefully, because the global database gives us a bigger picture of the vaccine across the world, but also regionally, particularly if we, we know there are certain um, peculiarities or similarities amongst our populations. So I have a quick question for you, and I will ask Kareem to launch this poll. And the question is, I'm hoping, uh, Kareem, just let me know if you if you launched it. Yes, great as well. Yes, so I said, agree. Thank you. So you will see there, and you can select one of the answers, the best answer you think is correct, and then submit it. The question is, for COVID-19 vaccines, the number of adverse events following immunization due to coincidental events is expected to be higher than usual due to vaccination of adolescents who take more risks, vaccination of adults with comorbidities, vaccination of infants with developing immune systems, or all of the above. So go ahead and select the answer you think is correct and click submit for us. We will give you about 30 seconds.
Okay, Kareen, are you able to see um, the back end of the answers that are coming in? Yes, I am. Can you share those for us? So I'm going to end the poll now and we'll have the results. We yeah. have 100 and two persons, up to four persons have, have been answered now. Okay, so the results show that most of the participants selected vaccination of adults with comorbidities. That was 54%, 45% of participants selected all of the above, and 1% of the participants selected vaccination of infants with developing immune systems. Thank you. Oh, great. So we can see the poll results. Thanks for that, Kareem. So those who chose B or vaccination of adults with comorbidities, that's correct. Um, so when we're thinking about COVID-19 vaccines, because this is new in terms of use in so many adults with comorbidities, we expect that there will be coincidental events occurring because of those comorbidities. For instance, someone who's living with hypertension or heart disease, they, they're not, the natural pathology, if their condition is not well controlled, they may have a heart attack, they may develop clots, they may develop um, surface diabetes, we have an incidence of elevated blood glucose happening. And because when they get the vaccine, if they were not well controlled and that event happened after vaccination, it would be reported as an adverse event following immunization. But it's not necessarily due to the vaccine because there are other factors. The control of the disease would be considered or the lack of control, it's a coincidental event. So thank you for that, Kareen. Great. Okay, so vaccine safety monitoring, and I've highlighted five main areas of work. First, the analysis of these reports of suspected adverse events. And this is the same approach used for suspected adverse drug reactions. So where there's an adverse event that occurs following immunization or receipt of that vaccine, there must be an analysis of reports received, whether it's a patient reporting it to a system or a healthcare professional reporting it to a, that passive system. There's also active surveillance systems designed in certain countries that would capture information. Safety studies conducted by the manufacturers would inform the vaccine safety evaluation research that's done to look at safety in real life or in a particular group. And then there will be information shared around the world that will help inform that vaccine safety profile. So this is a map as to, to give you an idea of some of the decision-making process. So we have the multiple sources of information to our left. And at the base of your screen, you're seeing where the passive surveillance from the public or healthcare professionals feeds into the national system. But manufacturers may also receive those reports, so they also have to share that information. The national regu the regulator then needs to determine how do I validate this? Is it likely to be caused by the vaccine, yes or no? So that's why knowing how to classify the reports is the most important step, is one of the first steps we have to look at. So if the answer is yes, it moves to the interpretation stage. Does it change the benefit risk balance? If there's a change in the benefit risk balance and there's a growing risk that's beginning to outweigh the benefits, we have to make take some action, what we call risk minimization. And that could involve adding warnings, restricting the use in certain populations. And depending on the nature of the concern, you may need to retrain personnel. So if there's a programmatic error, and I'll talk, to, talk about programmatic errors in a minute. If there's no change in that benefit risk balance, then there's no change in the use of the vaccine. So stakeholders wait, uh, can be varied. And there's a lot, there are a lot of players or and resources and all of these all of these stakeholders provide information at different levels that inform this monitoring process. They are national stakeholders, regional and global stakeholders. Because collaboration 
just as collaboration was key for manufacturing vaccines, it's also, it's also important for the monitoring of the vaccine safety. There's a shared responsibility, so the manufacturer is not off the hook. The national authority still has some responsibility as well. And there are regional entities that support the decision making that share some responsibility too. International collaboration is key, and we need to be able to map the safety across the world once we deploy these vaccines. So causality is one term you will hear that underpins the decision making, because after the investigations are conducted, there must be a structured process for assessing causality. And I will not go into details about causality assessment because there are, it, it gets very technical. And at this point, today's lecture is to introduce you to these concepts. So at the national level, we have the ministries of health, national regulatory authorities, expanded immunization programs, and national pharmacovigilance centers. And you may say, but um, are they all the same? It depends on the context. So in our settings, the ministries of health take on or oversee all of these authorities and programs. In other countries, it may be separate. So the National Pharmacovigilance Center may be separate from the National Regulatory Authority, depending on the country you're in. So generally, just to keep that in mind. Adverse events following immunization, AEFI, there are committees that need to be established to review the reports that are being received. And there should be a National Immunization Advisory Group that informs and advises on the immunization program itself. They also take a look at safety information that's, new, that's current, as well as emerging and provide technical advice to policymakers. At, the, at another level, you have healthcare workers who are very important, the vaccine manufacturers, academia who get involved in research, and you have the vaccinated persons who have some responsibility with you know, pro providing correct information and as much information as possible to help that process move forward. The media is going to be very important. And I, speak, I will speak a little later about um, the rise in the number of case reports and media has a lot to do with that. And non-governmental organizations and professional societies also have a role to play. So at the regional and global level, some countries and some regions have their own regulatory networks because um, with regulating medicines and vaccines, over time we found that standardized approaches and using efficiencies and sharing information tends to be more efficient. For the European Union, the European Medicines Agency conducts a centralized or joint assessment to authorize COVID-19 vaccines. So they also maintain a database to monitor these vaccine safety reports that are submitted by the different countries. So that's why after there was the, um, the reports of vaccines being halted and reports of thrombosis in countries in Europe, you saw a statement by the EMA because they are the uh, body that centrally authorized those vaccines and they're the body that centrally gives statements and they will do the assessment and do the scientific, take a look at it. So the national authority has some work, yes, but the EME has a broader remit. African Vaccine Regulatory Forum, so the African, um, there's an African CDC and they formed a regulatory forum for vaccines. And this really got strengthened and um, pushed out because of Ebola as there was, uh, they had challenges with the Ebola outbreak some years ago and there was the move towards an Ebola vaccine. So they formed a regulatory forum. There's also one in Southeast Asia and in CAFA, the Caribbean regulatory system, we formed a network of our focal points for pharmacovigilance to start working together. Um, and this is voluntary. At the regional level, there are technical advisory committees in all WHO regions specific for immunization that provide recommendations and strategies for immunization priorities. And they continue to look at information and provide updates. And when we list all the global stakeholders, they, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are very key ones that help countries standardize the approach to 
vaccine safety surveillance. And I will point to WHO pre-qualification team because that's the team that uh, authorizes and assesses vaccines for emergency use listing. They would take a look at the data, they would take a look at the inspections, they would look at the quality of the manufacturing before saying, um, yes, this product, product is safe and effective. The Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety has an important role as well. And you may have heard of the Strategic Advisory Group of Experts for Immunization. And this group puts out interim recommendations and it's called interim recommendations because as more information comes in on efficacy and safety, including um, reward effectiveness, they update their recommendations and I've provided a resource so that you can see where you can find their documents. It's publicly available. I will also speak to the Uppsala Monitoring Center because that's um, UMC at the base of your screen there. UMC maintains the global database for adverse for pharmacovigilance, and that it, it includes reaction reports for medicines as well as vaccines. So the vaccine safety surveillance idea, we've gone through why we need it, where we get information before vaccine is marketed, and the stakeholders and their rules. So vaccine safety surveillance is important for us to detect, investigate, and analyze adverse events following immunization, as well as adverse events of special interest to ensure we have an appropriate and rapid response. So we can think about five main goals um, globally, the detection of events to provide timely data, the generation of data to help us characterize the safety of the vaccines in use. For instance, that characterization may point to a specific age group, may point to a specific um, type of condition, and that would inform if we should avoid it or if we should continue using it. The monitoring of the benefit risk ratio to see how it changes with new information. Investigation, we need to also investigate, assess, and validate signals and design appropriate interventions. And all of this is important to communicate to the public and help build stakeholder confidence to ensure we are, and because this is an ongoing process for the life of the vaccine as long as it's on the market. So it does not end after a year or after two years. This has to be ongoing work. So the same, um, if I map them out, uh, you will see the same themes because the objectives tie very strongly to the goals. And just to add in there, you have the detection of clustering if you look at D, but we also need to detect immunization errors and safety signals. And while we're on this, I, I heard um, someone say they've never filled in um, a form for adverse events following immunization. And it's important that we help health professionals understand why this is a, we need to provide information to regulators. But it's also important for us not to assume that because we have to fill in this form or submit a report, it automatically means a vaccine is unsafe. It simply means that we are tracking and we have additional steps before we can determine if it changes that benefit risk balance. Where a country can extend to advanced safety, safety surveillance systems, where they can implement it for adverse events of special interest. Maybe they can launch studies that look at patients with a particular adverse event that's very critical and monitor and track that particular group that's encouraged. Where there can be research on newly observed occurrences or concerns that's also encouraged. And of course, improving on local and safety data. So the previous slide, shows the basic functions and the basic objectives, but these are additional considerations that some countries can undertake because WHO is aware that countries would have different capacities to undertake the surveillance. So the key surveillance that must be done, uh, this was, which was on this slide, these are the basics that we definitely want all countries to be able to do. So, so there are four main surveillance strategies we can um, think about, or that we know about, sorry. Passive surveillance is where cases are not sought out. It's mainly where 
there is an event, an adverse event occurs, and there's a notification to a particular network. So a health professional may receive a report by a patient who came in for a routine visit, and they may say, okay, I, after the vaccine, this occurred, and that's passive notification. This can also be done by patients directly to the network, and this varies with the country. So some countries would have um, accessible tools, maybe electronic tools, in which persons can call in or submit a report, and then at the national pharmacovigilance network or system level, someone would follow up and get additional details um, to assist with investigation. Active surveillance is where a specific protocol is designed and certain health facilities are targeted. And the design is such that we're going to go to different health facilities, talk to health professionals, review records, and extract any cases that resemble our definition for that adverse event of special interest. Stimulated passive surveillance is where instead of waiting for the patient to come to a health professional, health professionals may be trained and encouraged to report and encouraged to follow up by a more active or proactive um, event or tools. And sentinel surveillance is where there's a design for a specific um, network of institutions. It could be hospitals or all ICU wards throughout the country, and you're looking for a particular condition that you would like to monitor. And it's usually for adverse events of special interest. So this approach is where it could happen, it could be decided on later on. So let's say we rolled out vaccines this year and we started noting certain adverse events of special interest. And next year we design a study just to track all persons who show up with this particular reaction um, after vaccination and try to characterize it and see if there are any associations that would be sentinel surveillance. So the AEFI, uh, the ad adverse event following immunization, is defined as an untoward medical occurrence, so something unpleasant that follows immunization. So that's the immediate thing, it follows immunization, but which does not necessarily have a causal relationship with the usage of the vaccine. And that's important to note because you may hear about reports of adverse events following immunization, and we make the error of assuming that means uh, there's a risk already. A risk is only defined when you've done all the key investigations and analyses. So that AEFI could be based on an unfavorable sign, an abnormal lab finding, a symptom or disease that occurred. And in the COVID-19 context, there must be a clear definition. There must be a clear protocol as to which cases would be relevant for investigation in order to inform a diagnosis that would then be tested through causality assessment. So there are five key categories or five ways in which we classify adverse events following immunization, and this is a global standard. So the first type is where the vaccine product itself would have, um, the AFI was precipitated or caused by that vaccine due to the inherent properties of the product. The second, is where you have a quality defect that caused that event to occur. And one example I could think of is where we have oral polio drops. So, you know, little droppers, um, the dosing is specific and there's a certain number of drops must be given. If in manufacturing that container or that dropper lid, there was an error and the dropper, the aperture is not large enough and the nurse administers the required number of doses, and the child does not receive the dose that is prescribed that is correct for producing that immune response, that is a quality defect because the dropper was not appropriately produced. This is important for manufacturers to know so they can investigate where the source was, they can investigate the container. So we're not even looking only at the vaccine itself, containers, storage conditions, all of these affect the report and the safety because if it, it's poorly stored, you can have um, deactivation or poorly or 
insufficient quantity of the vaccine or the, vi the viral particles or the, that needs to be developed or be produced, sorry, administered, you wouldn't have sufficient being delivered. So you have underdosing and then vaccine failure. The third type is an immunization error related reaction that may have happened because handling, prescribing or administration. This is one that's flagged particularly, we watch this closely with vaccines like Pfizer because a diluent has to be added. Once there, is a, there are additional steps involved in the preparation and administration, staff have to be trained so that we minimize these errors. If the error occurs, then it's important to report. I was looking through um, a dossier, a safety report from uh, one of the WHO dossiers and the manufacturer noted that in a given country, there were reports of leaks from the vial. And you would think, why is that in a safety report? That's in a safety report because it affected the delivery of the amount of doses from that vial. So um, production errors are also going to be captured. So when you see AFI reports or safety reports in um, shared among social media, 200 posts from this vaccine, it does not tell you which class of AFI or adverse effect, adverse event um, is being reported. The fourth is immunization anxiety related reaction. Because we're giving adults vaccines, there are concerns and persons come with their psychological concerns, which is natural. And there is an actual um, phenomenon of, phenom there's an actual event that can occur with persons who are very anxious. And we even saw it um, on, on television some months ago with one, a nurse who got her first Pfizer shot and moments later she fainted. And that generally, that can happen with adults because we have more processes and we have more concerns that we think about. Anxiety and stress has physiologic reaction in many persons. So that's an important um, feature or adverse event that persons need to take note of. And then the fifth one, the coincidental event that I mentioned earlier, that it was an event that was caused by something other than the vaccine product. So we have five categories. So the presence of an event does not necessarily mean it was the vaccine itself that caused it. There are many other causes that could have come and play. And a filling out a report does not mean the health worker who was involved is at fault or to blame. It's not about blame, it's about understanding where we can strengthen the system. But before we make final decisions, there must be a process of assessment to establish whether or not there is a causal relationship between that vaccine and the reported event. So I'm, I'm putting up serious AEFI because this is not the same as severe. Severe tells us about the intensity of reaction. But a serious adverse event is one where the outcome results in death, hospitalization, prolonged hospitalization, some disability or incapacity, a birth defect, or is life threatening. And this definition is important for national authorities to start to streamline and, and strategically approach adverse events that need to be investigated. So this cycle brings it all into perspective, hopefully. Um, so we have the detection point at which parents, guardians, um, health workers report on a particular event that occurred. The person who fills out the form provides that notification to the national authorities. The national committees need to have a procedure for investigating these adverse events that are reported. There must be a form of analysis and causality assessment based on the decisions from the immunization committees coming out of the causality assessment, that is important to, to frame feedback to the health providers, the health workers, to the public about the reactions that are being seen and the action that needs to be taken to protect the public. So just to, I need to flag certain things here. Do not confuse reporting rates with incidents of adverse events. And the reporting rates, for instance, if you go to the Medicines and Healthcare Products um, Agency of the UK, or even if you read one of our Vijay reports, you will see numbers of cases reported for specific vaccines. 
it's important to note that those cases came out of passive surveillance or spontaneous reporting. And they are subject to biases because they haven't been investigated. There may have been underreporting. There may be variations in the reports submitted by different persons, by different parties, whether it's a patient submitting a report or a physician or a health worker. There may be misclassification. There, it, these numbers may include incomplete reports. For instance, if the person has a history of a particular condition and it's not listed or stated in that report, if they're using other medicines and it's not in that report, then that's an incomplete case report. So these biases or these limitations make it difficult to estimate exposure. Also because if we think about incidents, incidents relates to time. And when, we, when those reports are submitted, there is not a lot of information that says how many persons received the vaccine in that given reporting period to enable calculation of incidents. In addition, different vaccination schedules around the world, if we look at the global database, the differences in schedules would influence what you see. So in one country where the very frail elderly are vaccinated first, then you may see more serious adverse events being reported out of those nursing facilities compared with vaccination of ambulatory persons with chronic conditions you may see a different amount or a different type of adverse events the priority groups influence it as well as the classification where there are countries with different capacities so a country that has uh, a developing system that hasn't reached full maturity and doesn't have advanced surveillance capacities, they would do, they may have a very simple reporting structure and they may be instructing, they may say to put to their, in their capacity, they may only be able to collect reports of the very serious events or they may only collect reports from hospitals. Another important behavioral consideration is the culture of reporting. If there is a sense of reporting means I am betraying someone or I am going to get someone in trouble or I will get in trouble for reporting, that tends to be a barrier to reporting, particularly from health professionals. But if there is a setting where in which people feel safe and comfortable to report and they understand they're contributing to the public good, you tend to see more reporting happening. The timing of vaccine campaigns also affects when these reports are received. So if there's a setting where there are, there are a lot of positive vaccine campaigns, you will see and or campaign for reporting to encourage persons and says, this is where you report, you can expect um, reporting to increase. However, you may expect reporting to increase and you may see a lot of minor reports, but that's okay. That's what the system is for. We're supposed to filter those out. If there's a lot of anti-vax um, sentiment, or there's a lot of concerns, and there's a lot of publicity about events that occur in different parts of the world, and those events are not put into context as to what these reports may include, and the lack of investigation, then that can cause more fear. And depending on the cultural context, the fear may, decide, may result in persons not taking the vaccine, or it may result in persons reporting everything that occurs um, following, following immunization. Irrespective of the stimulus, there, there must be a system in which we can streamline, we can sort, we can triage those reports and determine and follow up with some of the investigations. And that's the best way to know. And I put it in, I needed to make this clear so that when you start to see reporting rates of vaccine A over vaccine B, to keep in mind that if it's a spontaneous reporting system you're looking at, that there are inherent limitations that mean we cannot directly compare these reports because different um, factors affect what we're seeing. So avoid comparing individual vaccine safety using reporting rates, one. Um, the main thing, the main rule of spontaneous reporting is to detect signals. And this is useful for us to start to see how often um, the reports are coming in. 
and to point for cases that we may need to further investigate. So a basic um, graphing that shows you the healthcare provider, provider's rule, we definitely want reporting of serious adverse events following immunization so they can determine which ones need to follow up and investigate. Any events associated with a new vaccine which we are facing now, um, anything that may have caused and been caused by an immunization error, events of unexplained cause after within a month after vaccination, events that are particular concern to a community or to parents, and where there's swelling, redness, or soreness at the injection site that goes for more than three days or it extends past the nearest joint. So if you got it in your upper arm and this, there's swelling and it goes past the shoulder, that's an important um, reaction to report. So this is a, another similar graphic and it just adds the, the need to report on clusters. So if someone's working in a health facility and they're starting to see an unexpected rise in a particular reaction or event being reported, that's important. But take note of the arrow. It says reporters should not assess causality because you don't have enough information to really streamline or to sort things directly. So at the reporting level, we ask persons not to um, assess causality at the national level, at the investigations, they will sort through that. And you're right, I've listed the minimum information that needs to be in those reports. There must be an identifiable patient. There must be a report of that the, com the community, sorry, the national authority can follow up with. There must be an event that's clearly described as, as, as far as possible, um, the name of the vaccine and the lot number or the batch number for the vaccine. Additional information that could be collected will be helpful, such as the medical history of the person, other medicines being taken, if there are any lab test results, um, timing, the outcome, if the person is recovered or recovering, and seriousness, and if a diluent was involved. So I, I have been speaking in a while. Uh, this is our second poll, and I want you to answer this one. Before reporting an adverse event following immunization, the health worker should be certain that the event was caused by the vaccine. Is this true or false? Tell us your opinion. Okay, how are we doing? Good, Great. I'm ending for now and okay. going to share results. All right, so 66% have said false and 34% said true. So it's false. The health worker does not need to be certain that it was caused by the vaccine. The main thing is that it's an event that occurred following immunization. It would be very difficult for that health worker to really truly confirm with certainty that it was caused by the vaccine. As I mentioned, there are other events that could have contributed to it. It could be a coincidental event. It could have been due to um, an immunization error. It could have been a quality related issue. Um, so any of the five categories could are possible. And that classification does not need to be done at the health worker level that really needs to be done at the national regulatory level or the immunization team, they would have to contact the reporter, contact the person who experienced the event and get additional details so that they could map out or determine they can eventually assess causality. So thank you very much for participating in that. So I definitely am happy that um, to note and be, be able to clarify that. So as a healthcare worker, you don't have to be certain that it was caused by the vaccine. You just need to know it happened after the person received the vaccine and allow the national authority to be able to streamline. The good thing about that is that it also tells the national regulator what are the common minor events, the common adverse events that would be expected. 
and it also maps out, okay, we expect certain types of immune responses, we expect certain types of, of proportion of seriousness based on clinical data, but getting the data from the ground helps them to get an indication. Um, but there, there are additional steps involved before we can be sure the event was caused by that vaccine. Thank you. So I mentioned a second type of adverse event, and these are the ones of special interest. And it's a predefined medical um, event that has the potential to be causally associated. And you see that term again, because it's at the start, we always have to consider there's a potential for an association. And that's why where you saw statements by the EME and WHO about clots that occurred after vaccination, that the terms used, what that is related to this, um, related this kind of language, because there's a plausible association. It's there's potential for it to be associated. The reason it's not, they don't define it as associated because to, to test for an association, you need to have a lot of cases and to be able to define and characterize the patients in which that case occurs and the events. So until that surveillance is ongoing, by the way, and for a, an event to be of special interest, like in this um, situation, it may meet one of two criteria. It could be a proven association with a specific vaccine or a vaccine platform. And that's usually a proven over years of use. So vaccines that we've been using historically for years, we're familiar with those AESIs because over time, we have sufficient information to say we've proven the association. It could also be a theoretical concern, which is more related to what we're seeing with clots. And there are papers that speak to the immunopathogenesis of the disease and issues related to the platform that may trigger inflammatory responses. But if there's also a concern that was seen in an animal model, that's enough as well to define an adverse event of special interest. So this table simply puts them side by side. The adverse event following immunization, it's an occurrence that happens after immunization, but does not necessarily have a causal relationship, whereas the AESI has the potential to be causally associated. So the AESI may have started off as AEFIs that we investigated and then moved to this category so that we will have studies being done to focus um, on using active surveillance and sentinel sites or electronic health records to be able to characterize and confirm the association. And that's why the language remains, it is plausible, that is a, it's a plausible link or it, they have not confirmed. But either way, both, approaches are important for us to characterize and understand it. So with the vaccines we are familiar with in terms of the WHO approvals, I went into the um, TAG reports from WHO and extracted um, key uh, notes or key terminologies for special warnings and precautions. This is not exhaustive for these vaccines, but I put them up all together so that you will see that it's not limited to one particular vaccine. WHO and the regulators are monitoring multiple types of events, particularly whether there was a suspected case in a clinical trial, or they saw something serious occurring in a particular part of the world. These have been noted. In addition, where there may be missing information, like about interchangeability, information that we're still going to be, that's still going to be important to the benefit risk balance, like efficacy against variants, um, duration of protection, and limits of effectiveness. Those are also flagged under precautions so that you will know what is still being investigated. What is helpful is that the SAGE recommendations put these into context for you. So a lot of the questions persons ask about using other vaccines or using different types of um, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine, that those are answered um, by the SAGE or SAGE um, group of experts for immunization. Of course, they also indicate 
where there are limits to the current information. Having limits to information does not mean something is not usable or does not have utility. It means that we use it with, within reason and we use it and we continue to monitor because the threat of the disease is much worse than what we're waiting to get information on and we want to protect persons from severe illness and death. And those are very key outcomes that we're really battling here. So this table maps out again from the CH guidance and they have sections as to what's limited or what's been missing. And some key questions for this in, in terms of what has been a uh, precaution or noted. So interchangeability among vaccines, if it's one of the astrogenical group, those could be interchanged. If it's another vaccine, it's not recommended. The same product should be used for both doses. Where there's co-administration with other vaccine, WHO recommends an interval of 14 days. They don't say to stop because we still need to protect persons from other um, infectious diseases. We do not want returning to our communities. Um, so as much as possible, we continue routine vaccinations with that interval that's recommended, 14 or more days between COVID-19 vaccine and any other vaccine. For children and adolescents, the information is still being generated. Um, for Pfizer-BioNTech, the recommendation was for use for persons over 16. They did not recommend it under 16. But um, just last week, EMA and the week before, the US FDA have approved it for use in persons 12 to 12 and up. So that means this recommendation is likely to change because WHO works closely with the European Medicines Agency. There is information on pregnant and lactating women, but because the benefits continue to outweigh the risk, they do not recommend um, withholding it. They can be offered it. You must provide information on benefit risk and limitations, allow them the choice, but there's no need to test women for pregnancy before they vaccinate. And there's no need for women to stop breastfeeding um, if they if they're at risk of getting COVID-19 and the vaccine will protect them and their baby. That's excellent. Three minutes left. Okay, I will try my best. <laughs> um, so there's additional information on persons living with HIV um, being as part of the target group. WHO recommends vaccinating again, all within the context of counseling and benefit risk um, information. And same for immunocompromised persons and those who have had the previous infection there may be, they may be offered it um, ir irrespective of the history of whether they've had COVID-19 symptomatic or not, but that there may be a delay in vaccination because they may have some immunity that will last a little longer. So if you have limited supplies, you may want to delay vaccination. And of course, as the data on the duration of natural immunity um, emerges, that will be updated. Persons with a current acute infection they should not be vaccinated until they recover from the acute illness and they are the mini criteria for um, coming out of isolation and persons who received monoclonal antibodies or convalescent plasma they should be deferred from vac being vaccinated for at least 90 days afterwards so i have shared the key resources and i anytime you have to get the most current information on the vaccine state, um, efficacy and benefit I strongly recommend looking at the WHO SAGE group information or documents of the individual vaccines or going to the product information. Uh, PAHO has a dashboard for pharmacovigilance that follows specific, specifically follows the vaccines and WHO's team prov provides information. Different authorities have national surveillance systems, um, including the Medicines and Healthcare Products Agency of the United Kingdom, there's, a, there's also one in New Zealand, in the US, and in Canada. So these agencies come, come, commonly or they often provide updates as to um, cases they've received. And what they're, as a, again, just keep in mind what we, I mentioned earlier. So before I close off, we're coming to the end, I'll tell you a little bit of CAFA CRS, Vigicarib Network. This network was formed to help CAFA member states to receive and to share reports within the region about adverse reactions or substandard and falsified medical products. Um, 
and we are moving to expand this to vaccine adverse events following immunization. At the CRS, we are supported by PAHO agencies and, and we communicate with other agencies. For instance, market authorization holders, so let's say um, there's a representative from Pfizer and they receive a report for about an adverse reaction. We've had some of those reports come from them to us because the country may not have had an, uh, a form in which they could use. So we act as a conduit and we also provide information to the global database um, where permitted by the country. And our most recent newsletter, um, and this, the data we pulled from the international database related to adverse events following immunization up to 14th of May. And there were 352 case reports and they were from um, countries in the region, three main countries, but uh, I can't tell you how many for each country. Uh, 30 of those were considered serious. And the top reaction terms are what you're seeing there, headache, fever, chills, fatigue, myalgia, bone pain, vaccination site reaction, malaise, nausea, and dizziness. So you can see and keep in mind, this is simply a count of cases that were reported into the global database. Again, that's voluntary does not mean that that's all the events that ever occurred across our member states. The reports are mostly descriptive and they do not, it does not um, define, it does not distinguish between those that are under investigation or those that are incomplete or those that are due to coincidence or those that are due to errors uh, or pending causality assessment. That sort of assessment has not been done. This is simply a reporting rate and it's mostly related to the, the most common vaccine, as expected, um, because up to May, this was a vaccine um, that's being deployed in the region. So among the countries that report, of course, not all countries are reporting. So keep in mind that what you see has a lot of additional limitations. It's not a true picture. It just simply tells us about what kinds of reports have been received. So this is my last poll. And I have put a statement up here, and I want you to assess whether it's true or false. So from the UK database, 61,000 yellow cards, that's the reporting form, have been reported for Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. 182,751 reports have been submitted for AstraZeneca's vaccine, and 1,972 for Moderna's vaccine. So the statement is, this means that AstraZeneca's vaccine is the least safe. Is this true or false? What do you think? Okay, Kareem, Kareem has, okay. has stopped the poll. 99% said false and 1% said true. So you, 99% of you are correct. This is false. And I want to, thank you, Kareem. So I want to go further to show you something that's from that very same website. This was taken from the website directly underneath the paragraphs that provided that summary. It is important to note that yellow card data cannot be used to derive side effect rates or compare the safety profile of COVID-19 vaccinations as many factors can influence ADR reporting. And although persons may share um, reports, many times I don't see this caveat being shared along with it. So now that you know, um, let them know as well, please read the full screen, go back to the site that they got it from and flag it because the WHO's program for international drug monitoring also provides this statement when it produces information and EMA when it produces that sort of um, information also flags includes this caveat because they also recognize that persons it's easy for persons to think I can compare the safety profile and all the side effect rates and that's not true and it's the same for our Vigicarib newsletter when we present um, the number of reports and uh, the proportion of reports report uh, for a particular reaction, it does not mean that it's attributed to the vaccines. First of all, there are other factors that can influence reporting 
um, reporting can speed up with certain types of advertisements or social media posts or reporting can slow down depending on the rollout. So if there's a lack of supply of a particular vaccine, then you will see you're likely to see less reports. So keep in mind, reporting rates don't indicate incidents. Avoid using them to compare vaccine safety. There is a much more complex step or many more steps involved before we can um, pronounce on vaccine safety globally or even in different countries. And keep in mind that reporting has its own biases. So some persons may be avid reporters and say, I'm going to report every single thing because this is going to help. And then there's some persons that say, I don't need to report anything. So there are behavioral aspects that we need to also keep in mind. So I will thank you. I'm not sure how much over my time I went and we will proceed to the Q&A. If, that, if that's okay with Karine? Yes. Um, so there are several questions in the Q&A um, which relate to breastfeeding women and if they should take the COVID-19 vaccine. Okay. So that first one, and I will point you back to, um, that may have come before I got to the SAGE guidance, uh, WHO's advisory across all of the vaccines they've reviewed include, once those, that woman is in a target group that is priority for being vaccinated because of a high risk of death or disability from COVID-19 disease or infection, yes, they should be vaccinated. However, you still need to provide that woman with information on the benefits and risks um, so that she can be informed. Okay, so one of the participants posted a comment. By now, hasn't it been established that in view of the lack of real serious side effects, isn't it wise to vaccinate pregnant women? as the serious effects of COVID-19 infections are much more serious than any known side effects of the vaccination itself to the mother and unborn child. Just a comment. So in the chat box, we have a question. What pharmacovigilance support is offered if a vaccine used is not approved by a stringent reference authority or WHO? Sorry, I just need to let me try and see if I could also see that. Sorry, could you read that again? What, what PV support is offered if a vaccine used okay. in the country was not approved by WHO or a stringent reference authority? That means the national authority has taken on the responsibility for monitoring. So it depends on the pharmacovigilance um, cap capabilities of the national authority. Um, the good thing with our, our immunization programs is that they've been very robust and they've been working for quite a long time. And the immunization officers routinely report to PAPO and they have been involved in training. So there's support on the end from the immunization program. There's training support offered by PAHO. There's also support from CAFA CRS because once a member state has a, we communicate with the focal point, if they do have an issue, whether the vaccine is approved by WHO or an SRA, it doesn't matter. The event is important and that's and it's in use in the country. Um, we also support in terms of helping them to report to the global um, surveillance system if there's a, they have an account and if not, they can report to us and we combine and we share it, share within that network of regulators. Um, so, where we need additional support for an analysis. The country has to do that investigation to do the causality assessment. But we um, both, all the agencies um, globally and regionally have mechanisms in place to support those countries, irrespective of whether WHO approved it or not. That's not, that's not, a, that's not a limitation. Um, so if they choose to use a vaccine that wasn't reviewed by WHO or an SRA, it's important that we help the public and we help the country to make um, public health decisions to protect them. There's no, there's no limitation. Thank you. We had another question that we received via email. What classes of medications are contraindicated or not recommended for use prior and post vaccination? Thank you for that question. Um, right now, there aren't any specific medication classes contraindicated 
we continue to monitor, of course, and that will be updated. What, what there is in terms of contraindication, it's where the person had an anaphylactic or severe allergic reaction to a vaccine component in the past. Um, that once that component is present in a vaccine that they may receive, they should not be given that vaccine. Or if they receive the COVID-19 vaccine from the first dose and they had an anaphylactic reaction, they should not be given the second dose of that given vaccine. Okay, thank you, Dr. Exabon. We have another question. Are there any reported incidents in the Caribbean of blood clots associated with COVID-19 vaccine, especially among persons with pre-existing conditions and pregnant women? In general, is the vaccine safe for these two groups of patients? So I'll take the first part of it. Um, and it, that related to oh, blood clots and thrombosis. So yeah. the, the medra term in the global database um, tends to be thrombosis. That, that tends to be the way, and that's how um, I looked at it. Um, there have been three case reports from among all the member states that report into the global database. I can't tell you which countries it came from, those came from, um, but I can tell you for those uh, case reports that have been submitted, there were three. And it means at the country level, they would have to investigate those according to the national protocols and the level of and the, it does not it does not give me information as to the entire patient history other medications it does not speak to the, the additional details that the national authority would have to extract to properly assess if it was attributed to the vaccine so although the three case reports exist there's no evidence that they are it was caused by the vaccine that has to be determined by the national authority um, what was the second part it related to pregnancy and breastfeeding yes pregnancy and breastfeeding women and younger adults right so as i, I mentioned before in terms of pregnant or breastfeeding women the, once they are within the target group that's deemed at risk of of death and disability from COVID-19 they should be um, they should be vaccinated to protect them because the benefits outweighs the risk uh, again in the context of providing them with counseling that they need to have in place and there must there should be a, a way in which the the um, facility or the immunization team can follow those women um, so that they can continue to support them and determine um, how how their experience has been. Um, the other younger persons, this varies. So we've seen that most of the gas vaccines are recommended um, for persons 18 and older, with the exception of Pfizer, which now has evidence for younger persons. Um, their clinical trial was supported using 16 and older, and they have new clinical trial data. Um, however, persons younger than that, until we get clinical trial data that supports um, the supports that information, it would not, it's not recommended. None of them are recommended. Okay, thank you. We have another question in the question and answers. What are some of the signs or effects noted when someone has an anxiety related reaction to taking the vaccine and can it be distinguished? Okay, so there are various signs. I do not have all of them in front of me, but I know some persons get cold sweats, some persons feel faint, some persons feel dizzy. Um, and that's why the nursing personnel tend to ask you to wait for at least half an hour. Um, they're, they're not just looking for anaphylactic reactions. They also, they also monitor and you will find that someone asks you, how are you feeling today? Um, because they would observe your body language um, and they would be, they would have, a defined list of symptoms to to note if that occurs. I don't have that list in front of me, but that's that shouldn't be difficult to, to find for you. Okay, just a follow up to that same question. Um, what is the approach to persons who would have reacted to the vaccine in the past? Okay, so if persons got a first dose and they had a severe allergic response, they should not receive the second dose. So if they had an anaphylaxis to the first dose, or if they had um, an event that was clearly attributed 
um, but definitely it's usually related to an allergy. Um, they are not, they should not receive the second dose of that vaccine in that okay. vaccine. They may, they, there is more information coming out about using a different one, but I don't want to pronounce on it just yet. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we have another question. If is it necessary for someone who was COVID positive to take the vaccine, and if so, how long after? Is it necessary? Sorry, too. Is it necessary for someone who was COVID nineteen positive to take the vaccine, and if so, how long after? Right. So I would have to go back. Um, uh, let me go back. So some of the questions actually are in this. This slide. Yes. Well, Some of them I had to go through kind of quickly, um, time wise. But so this is, um, yes, and you talk about previous infection. So yes. if there's a previous infection and the person is no longer in the acute stage, they may be offered the vaccine and they should be offered the vaccine. The decision to delay it when they would be offered the vaccine could be based on restricted supplies or emerging data. So where we have information that's saying the natural immunity is showing to last at least six months, that's why sometimes you're seeing persons may say wait six months, but you're also hearing you can give it in, in three months. Um, there's no real, there's no specific um, cutoff date. The, it's based on the theoretical on and what we're observing in terms of immunity, but it also could also be affected by the supply issues um, but they should receive the vaccine um, as well okay we have a question for countries going through the pv exercise for the first time can CAFA crs offer support in the analysis of data collected we can offer support up to a point now keep in mind there are internal, there must be an internal investigation and they have certain criteria. It depends on at which point they need the support, but there's some things the, the national authority has could only do themselves. For instance, I can't call up a patient and I cannot call up a physician in a given country. Um, the national authority would also be the one setting the protocols for what um, for the actions taken in the event of this happening. There is causality assessment, which is standardized as a standardized procedure. But again, um, we have standards and recommendations, but how the country implements them would vary. So because there's that variation and we have 26 member states, we, are, we can offer um, support insofar as our own capacity can reach and that which is applicable to as many of the member states as possible. So when we have workshops, we have workshops for the regulators, we, we bring them together, we speak about what um, is in place, we show them the reports, we talk about how we're going, how you should report, but there's always a caveat of it may vary in your country. So CAFA has a certain remit, but the national authority, again, at the end of the day, decides on how they would apply that pharmacovigilance and that assessment approach and how the decisions are made, we provide support in terms of information and the education as far as we can. But detailed analyses, that's not yet um, directly under our purview, but we will support in terms of technical work and how they should go about those analyses as far as we can. Okay, or thank you. Yes, listen to do that. <laughs> okay, so the last question for today is Can CAFA CRS request AEFI and AESI reports from all of our regional countries to present a more comprehensive report of our region to us? So, what CAFA does, we work with the CMOs and we work with the regulatory authorities. Um, the, I don't think it's a lack of um, interest. I think it's more of all of the countries are pooling their resources and trying to build their capacity as well. So at this point, we support in terms of building capacity and where they can share. For instance, you, you may decide or a country may decide it needs to do additional checking on something or a case is pending additional information before they share it, which is reasonable. And that's, that's, their, um, that's their prerogative. We certainly 
want them to be at a point at which they can do certain things, yes, we do ask and we would integrate it into our strategic surveillance, our, our strategy for, for surveillance um, that's set out by CARPA for other areas. Um, so that's, we are continuing to work on that. Um, and hopefully, and that's why we have the newsletter so we could also share what we know, but remember, we can share case numbers, but in terms of the final outcomes, that's really going to be housed at the country and the country is really the avenue to share that information with you. It's really not for COPPA to share country's information directly with anyone. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. DeVos. So we have come to the end of today's webinar. So I would like to thank, first of all, Dr. Joyce and John, CAFA's Executive Director for setting the tone of today's webinar. I would also like to thank Dr. Rian X. DeVore for such an inciting and perplexed discussion about this crucial topic of COVID-19 vaccine safety evaluation. To those that assisted with the preparation of this webinar, which includes the CAFA comms team, Dr. Kisundan, Dr. Indar, and Ms. Lorna Thomas, Thank you all for your assistance. The PAHO advisors, Ms. Bogonia and Ms. Merrin, thank you very much. And we cannot forget to all of our participants for continuing to collaborate with us to improve in our efforts to strengthen the regulation of medicines, vaccines, and other medical products. We hope that this presentation helps to answer any questions that you may get in your daily lives and to help you navigate through reporting of SAVIs and the regional and global vaccine surveillance system. So I'll just like to highlight before you leave, CAFA has their first virtual health research conference exactly two weeks from today. So if you all are interested in attending, you may contact the conference secretary via the email listed here. These are just a few of the featured speakers. We have the Director General of WHO who will be addressing us on the first day of the webinar. We also have Dr. Joyce and John who will be addressing us. Dr. Ledrun who will talk about climate change which is very important to our region. And before you leave, kindly complete the survey and indicate if you, have an, if you would like to receive the certificate of participation. Thank you all. Do remain safe. Over to you, Dr. Exeter, for closing with. Okay, thanks. Just, just one thing. Um, you may not see the survey right away. When we end the webinar, it's it's likely to to show up. Um, so I just I was just adding some additional answers in the in the questions that I may have missed. So thank you again, and we hope that you would look forward to look out for our next upcoming one. We have a few ideas to brainstorm and in the questionnaire. Um, that you will receive by email, you will be able to see, um, you'll be able to tell us about a few other topics that you would like to learn about. Thank you again and have a good afternoon.